Welcome to the Booth Library Podcast. This is second in our interview series. Today we'll be interviewing Craig Titley. My name is Joseph Morse. I am a library specialist here at Booth Library, and I am continuously haunted by the ghost of Mary J. Booth. With me, as always, is... Logan Braddock, library assistant, Booth Library. He is not haunted by Mary J. Booth. She doesn't come up to the fourth floor. All right. So our special guest today is Craig Titley. So, uh, Logan, if you want to get started. All right, Craig. For those who don't know you, how would you describe yourself? You know, to us at the library, you're a big deal. Um, you were going to be kind of our featured speaker at uh, Eastern's Comic Con. Yep. But for the uninitiated, why are you such a big deal? <laughs> why am I a big deal? I don't know. I think it's you two and my mother that made me think that. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I was just telling you guys earlier how much I miss uh, Booth Library. That was my hangout. Yeah, it's a, lot, a lot of hours there. Uh, I don't think I'm a big deal. I think I was just uh, uh, a person with big dreams and and uh, good work ethic, <laughs> if nothing else, and had a lot of great mentors along the way, many of whom were uh, professors over at Eastern who I'm forever indebted to. Uh, I don't know. I just feel like I'm just lucky. I get to do what I love for a living. People are paying me for it, and I get to hang out with cool, creative people uh, who are way bigger of deals than I am. Is that right? Big, way bigger deals than I am? Something like that. So what do you do for a career? What I do? I, uh, several things. My primary career, I write feature films, and I write and produce television shows. That's the main thing I do. But I also have started a company called Discount Anarchy to fulfill all my other creative needs which involves uh, developing some video games, publishing books, creating comic books, uh, working with some uh, rock stars, doing concert promotion, fun things like that. So it's just all my other sort of non-movie and television related uh, creative endeavors. So, so you're starting comic book publishing? Yeah, I'm creating a few comic books. One of them based around there's this uh, uh, musician and artist slash rock star badass I work with uh, named Tatiana De Maria, uh, formerly of the band Cat, which if you ever went to Warp Tours, probably saw Cat a lot. Uh, she's also, uh, if you have Netflix, check out the new American Pie Presents Girls Rule. She wrote several of the songs for that and appears uh, as herself playing a concert at the end of, uh, at the end of that movie. But uh, she's just super, super cool and just made to be a comic book character. So uh, I promoted uh, her first solo show out here at the Whiskey A Go-Go in Los Angeles. And uh, I talked her into letting me do like a comic book uh, to pass out to all the fans that came at the show. It's sort of uh, got that part of uh, Discount Anarchy up and running. So literally, even though I come from, you know, I work from Marvel and all that stuff, I really had no idea how go out making a comic book so it was a big learning curve uh so now hoping to do a lot more of those things like that so how did you um get your path to eastern what uh what made you decide to come to eastern for for college uh interesting story well first of all i grew up in mattoon illinois i was actually born in mattoon and then when we were four we moved away to taylorville for a few years and then moved back when i was uh in like sixth grade. So Matt Toon, my stomping ground, uh, fairly close to Eastern. But the story few people know is that I had a full ride scholarship to the University of Illinois, uh, which I turned down in order to pay to go to Eastern. Uh, people like at the time were like, are you freaking crazy? <laughs> but I went up to the orientation thing at U of I and I didn't like the vibe. It was very like, you are a number. This is what you will do. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, I want to, I want two majors. I want to major in English and business. Like, oh, you can't do that. Uh, and I just got a weird vibe. So I had to tell my parents, like, even though it's free, I don't think I want to go here. Uh, so I'm going to get my application in the Eastern super fast because the deadline was like four days away. Uh, got accepted to Eastern where I didn't have to pay, uh, but Eastern let me have two majors, uh, 
English major and a business major, which I pulled off in four years. Nice. With a perfect 4.0, I might add. Um, and all the professors there, like at Eastern, you actually get to interact with your professors. Right. Bigger schools, you got a lot of GAs and things like that. And these professors became very, very instrumental in helping me chase my dream. And uh, when I applied to USC, the Peter Stark producing program for grad school, wrote letters, called them, harassed them until they uh, let me into the program. So if not for Eastern, I would not be where I am right now. So it turned out to be the smartest decision I ever made. So with your double major with, with business, was it always kind of your your dream to go into writing and, and movies? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, you know, I'm like a 70s comic book. You know, I grew up in front of the TV reading comic books. Right. But I was always uh, fascinated with storytelling and pop culture, whether it's movies or comics or television or uh, Saturday morning cartoons. It was always something I wanted to do, just uh, in the way that's possible. Here I'm a kid in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. <laughs> How does one even dream or think about that? Uh, so when I went to Eastern, it was always sort of in my mind to do that. Uh, and I also knew, so I was smart enough to know that any artistic endeavor, whether it's movies, television, things like that, there's a business component. Uh, it's art and commerce. So I'm like, well, I'll have the uh, English major, which is my art, if you will, which is storytelling, great literature, great writing, all of that. And then the business degree, which, uh, which I have found invaluable because so many writers I know don't know anything about business. I mean, I can practically write my own contract. Uh, I don't. My attorneys would kill me if I tried, <laughs> but uh, it just proved invaluable. And that crazy combination of uh, English major and business major is what also helped me get into Peter Stark program. They're like, well, this is interesting. We haven't had one of these come across before. So, you know, my, my letter, my application was about how we didn't have a film school until I created uh, my own sort of film degree, if you will, which is the business degree, the English degree, took some film and lit classes. Uh, and they were kind of impressed by that. Yeah. And the 4.0 and the professors I had that were calling them like, you got to accept this kid. So a combination of all those things, what got me into a USC, which uh, the rest is history, as they say. So you graduate from USC then, which is very prestigious. And then what's your mm -hmm. step after that? Okay. Well, a little naive was I at the time. So I had this vision that if you go to USC graduate film school, the Peter Stark program, which is the producing component uh, of the film school, and they only took 25 students a year. I thought as soon as you graduate, you just hang up a sign is Craig Titley producer and Tom Cruise is going to walk in like, I hear you're the new producer in town. Here's my <laughs> new movie you should do. Uh, doesn't quite work that way. Yeah. What you do is you graduate and realize you are gainfully unemployed with a lot of student debt. Uh, and so I wanted to be in the movie business. So I took jobs as like PAs, uh, like set PAs on uh, uh, shows like uh, a universal movie called Mobsters from 1991. Hmm a TV movie about killer cats <laughs> I mean, doing all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but another interesting story about how Matt Toon saves the day, which is kind of the running theme in my life. Uh, so in between the two years of the Peter Stark program, we had a paid internship at a studio. Uh, and the director of the Peter Stark program at the time, Art Murphy, I don't think he liked me that much. I think he thought I was... I was the, one of the youngest people in the program, fresh from the Midwest, never been in the big city, kind of naive and wide-eyed. You know, I don't think I have enough of a shark personality for him, right? So there was uh, an internship at Universal for this lady, Donna Smith, who was the senior vice president of production. Uh, she was a badass, uh, you know, very strong woman at a time when most of those jobs were filled by guys. 
Right. She actually was a card carrying teamster. And uh, I'm heard one of the few people in the world that James Cameron is afraid of. <laughs> she was a production manager on, uh, I believe that was what she was, production manager on the first Terminator movie. And so, needless to say, she didn't mess around a lot and didn't stuff her fools lightly. And I think Art thought, throw me in with her. Uh, I will go home with my tail between my legs. Uh Right, right. Uh, she's she's tough. Uh, so you know, I'm the intern there, and she had like two or three assistants. Uh, didn't really pay much attention to me. Just who's this kid hanging out? Uh, and everything. It's like, who are you? Why are you here? And I'm like, oh, I'm with the Peter Stark program. I'm the intern. She's like, oh, it's another one of those. And walks away. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. Uh, and then one day, all our assistants were gone, and she's like, come into my office. I go in there. She's like, where are you from? I'm like, Illinois. She's like, where in Illinois? I'm like, eh, it's just a small town. She's like, what's the name of the town? I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, Mattoon. She's like, wait, Mattoon? With the original Burger King? It's not really a Burger King? <laughs> <laughs> and my father was a truck driver, and we used to always go to that Burger King. That is so cool. From now on, whatever you want, you want to sit on a meeting, you can sit on a meeting. If you want to go sit on a set, you can sit on a set. Uh, look at all the documents, whatever you want. I want this to be educational for you. Uh, so Art Murphy's plan backfired. Uh, but to this day, Art and I ended up becoming friends. And I'm like, you were trying to weed me out. He's like, no, I wasn't. I knew it put hair on your chest and make a man out of you. I'm like, no, you were trying to get me out of the program. <laughs> He's like, no, I saw potential in your kid. I did this. You owe it all to me. I'm like, no. You were... So anyway, that was our running joke for the rest of his life. We ended up becoming quite fond of each other. So crazy, right? Yeah, no, that is some small world business right there. That's crazy, man. That's awesome. Who knew yeah. Burger King would, would help your career so much? Yeah. Exactly. Let, let alone our weird little Burger King. Yeah, crazy. but because of Donna Smith, uh, after that internship, uh, you know, I went and finished my next year of Peter Stark program. And then got a call from her one time, like this director, Joe Dante, uh, you know, who did Gremlins and the Howling and Interspace. Uh, he's moving his production company to the Universal lot where she was. And they are looking for uh, like a full time assistant for Joe and kind of an office boy. And I told them, don't hire anyone until you meet Craig. So I went over, interviewed with them, got that job. And that was film school part two for me is the. Uh, because Joe Dante, I mean, you know, his circle right. of friends were Spielberg and John Landis and Rob Bottin and Chuck Jones and yeah. B.B. Cates. <laughs> I mean, all the greats at yeah. the time. And he's just like a film nerd. So he'd like, there'd be some like film festival of old AIP films. You'd get tickets for everybody in the office. Like, you got to go see all these things. And I, one of my jobs was getting drive. So I had to drive him home every day and we just talked film and, insider stories about the makings of gremlins and working with Spielberg and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, while I was working for them, uh, they didn't have a big development staff, which is, is the group of people who find scripts, work with writers, and all that stuff. So they would give me a bunch of scripts to read that were submitted to them, which I would then it's what's called coverage. You read it. So the bosses don't have to, and right. then you do like a one page summary and that kind of thing. They really liked my coverage, and then they started having me do, do notes. So I was reading so many scripts, that's when I said, you know what, I should really write a script. So what I always wanted to do, I can't just be a producer, but maybe if I write a script, uh, it will attract a better writer, and then I can be a producer. Um, and then before you know it, I was selling scripts. For about the first five years of my career, I thought I was a fraud. And People keep hiring me to write scripts, but I'm not a writer. I'm a producer. When are they going to figure this out? Oh, my God. Um, and then eventually one day I just realized, oh, my God, I'm a writer. I'm not bad. Uh, so, anyway, that's a very, very long story. But there's all the details. No, that's cool, man. Logan and I are both Star Wars nerds, it turns out. And you wrote a ah. couple of episodes of The Clone Wars. How did you uh, stumble into the Lucasfilm universe? Uh, I didn't, first of all, also a Star Wars nerd. Nice. And uh, I don't know how old you guys are, but I got to see it uh, 
when it opened the Capitol Theater in Taylorville, Illinois. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. So, huge Star Wars nerd. So, yeah, it's like you never even, because Lucasfilm, I mean, it's hard enough to crack into the movie business, but right. Lucasfilm is its own isolated fortress within that. Yeah. Uh, Al- Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah, but it was, um, I'd written this script that never got made uh, for Sam Raimi's company. It was basically a, a, a Pirates of the Caribbean kind of version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Oh, okay. And I still, to this day, think it's the best thing I ever wrote. Uh, and it had a lot of heat around town. David Fincher was circling it for a while, things like that. But it was just crazily expensive. And because it's public domain, there were like three other competing projects. Mm. So none of them ended up getting made. But when you have a good script, it makes its way around town. Right. And it made it to uh, this person, Dean Smith, who uh, was working at Lucasfilm on the Clone Wars, she was working for the producer of that, uh, who was working with George. Uh, crazy enough story, when I was uh, the assistant at Joe Dante's company, right? Mm-hmm. She was a, an assistant at Universal for Sean Cassidy, who was just starting a TV career at the time. So our paths was act- had actually crossed before when we were assistants, and then this is like 15 years later. Right. But anyway, she uh, read the script, liked the voice of the script, called my agent, said would he be willing uh, to come up to Lucasfilm uh, to talk about Clone Wars, which, you know, the season one hadn't aired. Right. Uh, and they're like, well, we think we can answer for him. And the answer would be, yes, of course. <laughs> so uh, they flew me up to Lucasfilm Animation. They screened for me, I think, the first four episodes. It's kind of like a vetting process. They just they fly you up there to make sure you're not going to be crazy or too nerdy or right. awkward, you know, like, oh my God, hello, Star Wars. Can I meet Mr. Lucas? You know, because <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Uh, but, you know, I've known her in the past. It was funny. Like, you know, we know each other from back then. Um, and met the team, uh, Dave Filoni, uh, Catherine Winder, who was producing them. Uh, and so they gave me an outline for an episode that they hadn't quite cracked script wise. That was sort of my initiation. Right. I went home and uh, wrote the script that was uh, turned out to be season one, uh, Blue Shadow Virus, part right. one. Uh, and, and I wrote it and they liked it. And the coolest part was uh, after my first draft, they would send me the draft with George Lucas's handwriting on it hmm. with his little notes and everything. Wow. I'm like, oh my God. That is so <laughs> cool. I still have them in a vault. Uh, but they liked the script and he liked the script. So they brought me back to do another episode season two. And this time I got to go up and sit in the room with Dave Filoni, uh, Catherine, uh, Drew Greenberg, who was a story editor who I ended up working with later on Agents of the Shield. And George Lucas himself. Oh, wow. It's like five of us sitting at a table where George would just look through his little binder of notes and start spitballing ideas. And uh, that's where you kind of really get to see the genius of the guy. Uh, Just looks up into space and starts ripping all these ideas, which ended up becoming the Zillow Beast story arc. And you're just sitting there trying to keep up with him, typing as fast as you can, because then you take all that and then you create the story and the outline and then the script. But it was, uh, uh, you know, once in a lifetime experience that will treasure forever. It was just really freaking cool. So just and the just, whole time I'm just typing there like, that's George Lucas. That's George yeah. Lucas. <laughs> so, Don't pass out. Don't sweat. <laughs> so just, just to, to get a little more granular on that one, just because uh, the Zillow Beast, um, I remember really enjoying that episode because it has a giant monster in it and I like giant monsters. Uh-huh. Um, so you were saying uh, George Lucas kind of was uh, throwing out. So he, so how much did he throw out to that one? Was it like, you know, make it a giant monster, make it really hard to kill and put, uh, I think that one's got yeah, Anakin, I mean, Anakin and Macer right. in that. So does he like, did he specify those kind of things or was he just like big monster smash or whatever? 
no, it, it was kind of like the general structure. Like I think uh, on one of his yellow pads, he had Zillow beast written down. Right. And he's like, this one looks kind of fun. And it's like called the Zillow beast. We all look at each other like, is this going to be what we think it's going to be? He's like, <laughs> basically, you know, what if the kid I had to deal with Godzilla? And I'm like, oh, take me now, baby Jesus. This is the greatest <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> this one. Yeah. Jedi versus Godzilla. I know. Please. Yeah, it was oh. a good episode. But, but he starts spitballing, coming up, you know, with the structure. And that's when we realize it's going to be like a two-parter. Right. Uh, we, all these great ideas. So the general structure is there when I leave the room. And then I just have to turn into like a scene-by-scene scene thing and right. add little flourishes. Like it was my idea that the lightsaber couldn't penetrate the skin of the Zillow beast mm. and that whole thing where uh, Anakin runs up the spine of the Zillow beast and then leaps off and pitches a ride with R2. Uh, so, you, you know, uh, it's very, very collaborative, but man, oh, yeah. he's a story creator for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was not like, I'm just going to put my name on this and let other people do all the work. Right. He was very, very involved in the creation of the stories uh, and the editing bay with Dave Filoni. So it's very much his baby as it should be unlike three recent movies <laughs> <laughs> so transitioning from there you work with marvel then and agents of shield so how do mm-hmm. you get involved with that project yeah the same thing they uh uh let it be known that after season one they were looking to bring on a couple more writers and it just so happened that jeff bell the showrunner uh was friends with uh this writer, Christine Rome, who I worked with on The Cape. Hmm. And he was like, hey, do you know anybody that would have like, some Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. sensibility? Like, oh, you got to like be with Craig Pitley. So, oh, her one. Uh, big time. But that, that's kind of the way it works in this business. And then so they call my agents. They get a script read as a sample, which also was at 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea script. Hmm. They liked it. And I went and I met with uh, Jeff Bell, showrunner, and Jed and Moe, Whedon, the creators, of the show and all I remember is I remember two things one I was a big fan of the show right right and this is like I think this meeting was right before the final episode aired I remember the day of I called my uh, agents I'm like I think I can't take this meeting because I think it's going to spoil the season finale for me because <laughs> I don't know how I get to without them talking about that they're like are you freaking nuts you have to go do this uh so anyway, I, I told them that. Or my agents called me like, so we heard uh, that you don't want any spoilers. I'm like, please. And I think they like that. But I just remember this meeting, lots of laughter. Hmm. We just so hit it off. And it was just fun and laughter. And I really felt like I'd found my family. Oh, cool. uh, and sure enough, I did. Uh, you know, I got hired. And uh, Jed, Jeff, and Mo, uh, all of the other writer producers, the cast it was just like one big family there was a lot of love on that show no prima donnas no jerks and uh ah, i miss them every day since about a year ago that it all ended right for us in the writer's room then we sort of got to get together zoom wise to help promote the new season which just aired a few months ago yeah the final season but uh yeah best experience of my life best group of people we still have a text thread with all of us on board that going strong like a year later uh it really was that whole thing of finding your tribe loved every minute of it so so how long was your your involvement with uh marvel's agents of shield uh how many years was it wow. six seasons so six seasons six years yeah i think it was like early 2014 till mid 2019 so maybe five and a half and so how do you transition yeah. when when something like that is I mean, so huge and such a big part of your life for six years. How do you transition from, from doing that to, to moving on to your next project? Uh, it's a little tough in, in a lot of ways. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm a constant idea generator, right? Right. I'm constantly having ideas for movies or TV shows, and all this stuff. And when you're on a show like S.H.I.E.L.D., your deal is like the first two years you can't develop, which means you can't go pitch TV shows elsewhere because obviously they want you focused on the show. Um, Now I had features carved out so I could take all the feature work I did and I would usually 
to do that. I'd write like one feature for hire per year when I was working on Shield, just because I, you know, I'd work on that on the weekends, uh, stuff like that. Cause I just like lots of work and I don't have kids or a wife. So plenty of time. And, but transitioning back, it's like, wow, finally these like seven projects I have that I've been waiting to do, I can now do. But it was also, I think I went through some withdrawal from being away from this new family, right? Right. So I think for the first time in my entire life, I had about two months of, I couldn't be productive. I was just like, you know, putting on sad music and driving by the old office (laughs) (laughs) and stuff like that. You know, not quite that bad, but close, real close. Um, But then, you know, I sort of got away that little funk uh, and started setting up stuff, started pitching stuff, you know, and then sort of COVID hit. But I set up two two TV shows, um, both written, but now it's just a matter of like when and how are we going to shoot them. So I've been very busy and then just recently had my first book published, which is a bunch of essays on pop culture and mythology uh, that I'd written for my PhD program in mythological studies. So compiled all those. That was just released Monday, actually. Yeah. And that's called uh, the uh, Pacifica Papers? That is. Oh, you did your research. That's hot <laughs> off the press. You can thank Beth for that one. Uh, Beth Beth gave oh, us yeah. a heads up on that because Beth is always on the ball. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, you know, I did a crazy thing in the midst of my crazy, very busy career back when uh, it was before the Cape. It was, so it was before I got involved in television. So when you're writing features in television, you're also a producer. So you have to show up in an office and constantly reading scripts and everything. So it really consumes your life. Right. Uh, features, you write at home. You're kind of your own boss. You can like play hooky for a week and then double down next week or whatever. So when I was writing features, I decided I wanted to get my PhD in mythological studies from this school near Santa Barbara that had the Joseph Campbell library hmm. and all that stuff. So, uh, and they made it very easy to do because you just go up three days a month. You have one class all day Monday, one class all day Tuesday, one class all day Wednesday. Go home, read, write papers, repeat every month. And that went on for like three years. Uh, but I don't officially have the PhD yet. I still have to finish the dissertation, uh, which hopefully once the clock starts back up after COVID, right. won't be too long from now. Uh, but I had all these papers for every class. You have to write papers and because I'm a film nerd, I was writing papers on the Matrix and how it relates to the Hindu concept of Maya, things oh, like yeah. that. Nice. I did a Jungian analysis of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Uh, <laughs> I, I did a paper on uh, Native American myths and stories about Devil's Tower and how Steven Spielberg, unbeknownst to him, was kind of telling a version of the same myth, oh, wow. even though it was not intentional because... In the script for Close Encounters, he didn't pick Devil's Tower. It was a location. People were like, hey, we found this spot. He's like, I like that. That's perfect. So this weird thing in the air where he was telling a myth, very similar to, anyway, I'm going on a lot of stuff. But anyway, so I was, my papers were always like that. And they were kind of fun uh, and pop culture-y. Right. Uh, and then there's this publisher I, I know I was, talking to him he's like that, you should publish that that would be great i'll publish that that sounds like a fun thing so i dug them all out and read through them and fixed some of the clunky stuff some of the earlier papers and lo and behold it went out and doing pretty well i'm told so so what so what young yin archetypes are uh, shaggy and scooby anyway well shaggy and scooby are actually one you combine them it's right the shaggy scooby is the shadow Oh. which is the gluttonous. Oh, yeah. uh, if, you, if you think about their personalities, they're very gluttonous, they're very trickstery. Uh, they are that, sort of the, the animal instinct. Yeah, they, uh, and, the and, they're, and they're all about self-preservation too, right? Yes, for sure. But yeah, you should check out the book. You can get it. Yeah. Uh, the ebook is available, or if you want, I can send you one. Um, it's funny because it's called Essays on pop culture, mythology, and flatulence. Because <laughs> I, I wrote a paper, because I'm very much a trickster personality. I'm like, well, if I'm going to write an academic paper, I feel like some of my nose at the academy at the same time. Right. So I wrote a paper on flatulating tricksters, uh, which was 
it sounds funny and silly and ridiculous, but I it's all tied into the Union Shadow, and it's a very academic paper. Yeah. But they're like, I can't believe this student just wrote a paper on farting. <laughs> and not only that, but I'm like, this is going to be my dissertation. They're like, what? Please don't do this. I'm like, nope. I'm going to do a dissertation on flatulating tricksters because they pop up in every world mythology and how it ties into the shadow and all that stuff. So uh, we called the book The Pacific Papers Essays on Pop Culture, Mythology, and Flatulence. And then we were going to have a, uh, instead of the traditional book signing, we were going to have a farting where the producer would just feed me chipotle and baked <laughs> beans and then I'd fart on the first 100 copies. Oh. Which is how much I appreciate my own work. <laughs> Good times. It's, it's okay, backtracking just a little bit back to Agents of Shield. Um, so you wrote some episodes, and you eventually kind of graduated to like associate producer, and then producer, and you were full on executive producer for uh, at least a few seasons, right? Yeah, the uh, last two seasons I was an EP executive producer. Okay, so I really loved the show, um, and I honestly thought it had like the best fight scenes of any TV show, maybe ever. I mean, basically, anytime May shows up and starts kicking, it's just the best time. Um, how, mm-hmm. much, how much of that comes from the writing room, or do you guys? I'm I'm just asking dumb questions here, but I I'm okay. I got you here. Sure. I gotta know how much of that is the writing room, and how much of that is like the fight choreographers, or uh, how does that work? Because they were really good fights. Uh, generally, uh, we don't go into too much detail, right? Uh, on the fight when you're writing the script, it's just you know uh, May and whoever have a kick-ass fight you know <laughs> right if there are plot points that have to happen like somebody has if there are specific story related things within right. the fight we will script that out um but then you know we have great stunt coordinators and and they will just try to come up with something new and exciting that we haven't done before or using whatever the location is uh and then you know they will show it to us and then we will sort of critique it and uh, feedback like there. But, but normally, yeah, for chases and fights, you don't go into too much detail unless it's an important story point within the fight and or chase. All right. So I want to kind of go back to your Pacifica papers because, you know, I noticed you talk about Joseph Campbell. So does he kind of have an influence on your writing or how you think about writing? Yeah, very much. Uh, you know, Campbell is fascinating person. I, I love Joseph Campbell because, I mean, he's, in a lot of ways, you know, sort of everybody's gateway drug to mythology because he's just so popular, which is why the academic world hates him <laughs> because one, he never got a PhD, and two, he became successful. Right. So any other school except Pacifica won't even let you cite or quote him in an academic paper. They're like, you know, that's like forbidden. <laughs> uh, so, I, I, so I love that Pacifica just full on embraced him as they should because he was an intellectual giant. I mean, it's just petty jealousy. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I say in the preface of my book, uh, uh, the way I discovered Pacifica is I went up to Santa Barbara for the uh, centennial celebration of what would have been Campbell's 300th birthday. It was a three-day conference where people just read papers about Campbell and all that stuff. So I was bliss, right? Right. Uh, but uh, how do I put this? So when, it, when word got out, back in like the mid 80s or whenever that George Lucas had used Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces as sort of a template for uh, the Star Wars story, you know, used the whole hero's journey structure posited by Campbell in that book. Uh, a lot of writers and executives thought they found the holy grail that, oh my God, if you just stick to this structure, every right. movie will be a giant hit like Star Wars. So uh, it doesn't quite work that way. Wow. So I, I always say, Campbell, let Campbell be your guide, not your savior. Right. Uh, because uh, there's so much more to writing than just paint by numbers or uh, color by Campbell or whatever. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I love Campbell as a mythologist. Uh, but too many people, I think, become obsessed with uh, the structure that he talks about it resulted in a lot of uh, crappy scripts, quite frankly, and uh, disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> Not everything can be Star Wars. There's more that goes into it than just that. Oh, yeah. um, we're getting kind of close on time. 
where where can we find the book? Uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, I think it's also available on Apple. Yeah, you can, you can find it uh, paperback or uh, Kindle or ebook uh, on Amazon. Look for uh, Pacifica Papers, uh, and it should pop up. And then hopefully, you know, when COVID breaks, when I come back to Eastern for Comic Con next year, we can do the public farting there. <laughs> you guys can feed you guys can feed me the beans. <laughs> and the uh, Chipotle. Yeah, man. That'd be great. Because, yeah, we, we were really looking forward to having you out for that. We, we were really looking forward to the entire event. Um, I was I was heavily involved in a lot of it, and I was really excited. So, of course, yeah. that it was, like, literally the first thing that got canceled when all of this started was it was mm-hmm. a, it was a bummer, man. And we're, we're sorry about all that. Uh, but so are you going to do it again? though, no, once all this is over, we, we are we are hoping that when uh, yeah when things get back to normal, we are hoping that we will actually have the inaugural the inaugural Booth Library Comic Con. Uh, we are we're hoping we can have you out for it. Um, and again, we for really sure. appreciate that you that you agreed to come out the first time. It was really cool of you. No, I I love Eastern. I love going back. So don't have to twist my arm too much. Cool. I'm happy to do it. Well, um, thank you very much, Mr. Craig Titley. And, All right. Uh, thank you both. We'll let you get on with your day. Thank you so All right. much. All right. Thank you both. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Have a great time. All right. Thank you. All right. And that was Craig Titley, um, who has been involved in all sorts of very, 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 very cool stuff. Um, the dude was in a room with George Lucas. Um, so, and we talked to him. And didn't trip over ourselves too bad. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go die of a heart attack now. Um, this is, I, I'm Joseph Morris. This is Logan Braddock. Uh, this has been the uh, Booth Library podcast interview series. Uh, have a good day.